Well, this is great to be here. Thank you. We're just having a great time, and um, and I want to I want to start out reading uh, basically tonight. Uh, uh, I'm starting off with um, uh, something, uh, part one from Pie in the Sky, uh, which I wrote back in the '70s after reading um, Alan Fisher's Place. So. Um, I, and you'll see, as I read, read subsequent things, that um, how much Alan's work uh, influenced me all, all these years. So if you don't like it, you can blame it on him. <laughs> it's perfect. Thanks for being here. <laughs> so anyway, all right, this is part one of uh, Pie in the Sky. Cliché is sound. In listening, there are certain sounds each seems to repeat over and over. I'm reminded of Alan Fisher thinking of place, one aspect, the underground rivers of London and how outbreaks of influenza when charted on a map flowed along those lines, lines of construction, factories. Highways, homes, that's what, did I do that? No, I mean, no, I think it's off. It just went off. Yeah, I think it went off. That's, is that, that's okay. I mean, I can... Yeah, just go with it. Okay. <laughs> Does that mean I... I, I get rid of it. Yeah, get rid of it. Okay. That's... that's, that's okay. Crank so, it up. <laughs> all right, so, so lines of construction, factories, highways, homes, the top lines of once freely flowing rivers which surface one way or another. And it sounds as if these levels might apply to people, lines of construction, sentences, phrases, paragraphs, atop lines of once freely flowing sounds. In listening, a person has certain sounds that repeat, that surface, as parts of words pre uh, preferred. These are an individual's cliché sounds, using cliché in the industrial revolutionary origin of the word as a sound, the sound of a machine molding material raw or on a production line evoking a sound over and over, a suction created by the machine moving up and down on the conveyor belt, the breadth of the line. So, cliché as a construction has come to mean expressions overused, misused, but cliché as a sound is the inner life of a person's voice that surfaces one way or another in our industrial age. In thinking about cliché as sound, a question, whether these sound lines could be traced to a particular geographic location, that place being home for a person's voice, sound as the shared element of geography in the subconscious. What procedure could be used to find this place? Taking a clue from science, surveyors find the depth of various points by taking soundings. It occurred to me that, that P's work as lines of sounds, fragments that would rise up in him online at work, scribbled on slips of paper and then later strung together. These fragments would place his cliché sounds where soft vowels appear with hard consonant blends. I suppose that the Isle of Skye might be such a place. So I do these dictionary transcriptions and um, go to the sky glossaries and, and, and it I come up with this. And taking 70 examples from an, a linguistic survey of the Gaelic dialects of Scotland, including liquids and dentals and sibilants and nasals and spirits and diphthongs and occlusives found on Skye, I find that P's work contains but one example of sounds found there. So the, so this, this is basically, this, this, this whole setup with, with using sort of research from all sorts of disparate things that, you know, that I, um, uh, a tribute to Alan. Um, I, I combine that with the, uh, the error tracking subject. Um, I'm always wrong, and, and I'm, I'm using the research to, to sort of, uh, you know, create a, a web of interactions that uh, get me away from that. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to read from a couple of, a couple of recent projects of mine. Another thing I, I say, I don't call these manuscripts, I call them projects, like Alan does. Um, this is uh, a project about animal rights, and it's called the Opposable Dumbs Project uh, because it's based on um, not, uh, hum not people having human rights and extending them to animals, but looking at how humans and non-human animals um, are different in the ways that we don't have language. So that's the project. And, it, you know, we get the labor movement in there and all sorts of things. And um, uh, I go through, uh, 
I go through some of the uh, the early animal rights activists like Henry Spira, who was a union activist with the National Maritime Union and had the most uh, successful uh, animal rights protests in the 80s, um, where he got uh, Revlon to develop alternative uh, uh, procedures for testing their um, cosmetics, et cetera, et cetera. But um, when it came to factory farming, um, uh, Purdue just used his, he had a, uh, Henry Spirit had a uh, campaign called, uh, it was right at the beginning of the first Gulf War, and the Gulf War now by bombing Iraq with Purdue chickens, which um, Purdue actually turned around and uh, they countered it and used it to promote their, um, their uh, chicken by touting their hens as alternative foods since they were fed natural marigold petals. So we're starting here at uh, the most successful protests by a union activist in the 1980s were for animal rights. Lament for the unity in utility under capitalism. Sim plus from us. Last part, not blended so. Low force and full raise to name. Guild math shatter seven low. His smile owns breath past blasted fame. Proud rage our grades were steps wisp of bowl. Toil for one word, round cling, sunk to hush, ally dribbling cries, God, why not cite our spare this rise? I'm sorry for the ugly phrase, unity and utility under capitalism. Ill flavored adjectives balk, minatory indifference curve of goods where there is no preference for one over the other, like awe. If one bracket formed consumer, was equally satisfied with 10 peaches and two avocados, two kiwi and 12 peaches, or one-fifth an apple and one-fourth a banana, these combinations would all form a line on canker, cantankerous, curlish, corrupt, crab, crabby, cranky, critical, cross, cross, grain, crotchety, crusty, attacky, the person arguing rather than the argument itself, perverse situation called rational, in reference to the ream that you or others are homo economicus, largely. Ever since the publication of Animal Liberation, Peter Singer has been commonly known as the father of animal rights, even though he's a strict utilitarian. Rejecting the notion that animals have rights because they are not subjects of a life, he focuses on the consequences of actions that benefit or harm them. But for the readers living within a system where profits are maximized by hiding harms, the only trade-off they know is supply and demand. The only demand they know is union corruption. The only supply they know is stream of con and stuff and stuff and stuff. Damn, con and stuff and stuff, lament. Long train of events is wrapped up slower, rolled up in chaise, or as it is called, the pulling of heated metals produces some slip in weekday serm happiness. Activity to forget the use of that word, all the changes, indefinite, incoherent, feeling in more and more complex defending, public temper performed, varied springs. As Solon moved to strengthen the Greek city-state by portraying the casualties of war as heroes, the existing practice of mourning the dead, words broken into sounds by the cries of many women, was banned, and funerals hidden from sight. The law stipulated that there were to be no more laments outside the home and specified the degree of kinship necessary for a woman to legally accompany a corpse to its grave before dawn. The sound of collective wailing evoked fears of wild animals on the move and of an uncontrolled revenge undermining the best interests of the state.